Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Over the course of General Chemistry 1 and the first part of Gen Chem 2, we've looked at lots of different reactions, from combustion to precipitation and lots more. But believe it or not, the kinds of reactions we've looked at so far are just a tiny fraction of the chemical reactions that are possible, and most of the ones we've looked at have one thing in common that makes them a little rare. To find out about it, we'll eventually meet up with Napoleon Bonaparte and travel to some of the most remote parts of modern Egypt. To get there, let's start by thinking about some of the reactions we've looked at in past videos, like these. These don't seem to have very much in common with each other, but there is one similarity between them. Each of these reactions happens in one direction, from left to right. For example, this middle reaction is a combustion reaction in which methane and oxygen combine to form CO2 and water. That's a very rapid exothermic reaction that you may have seen many times before. But the reverse reaction is very unlikely. We don't usually see a reaction in which CO2 and water combine to form methane and oxygen. So all three of these reactions almost always happen in only one direction, and we show this by drawing an arrow between the reactants and the products, and this arrow points only in one direction. Reactions like this are called irreversible reactions. However, it turns out that irreversible reactions are actually only a small minority of all the chemical reactions that are possible. In most cases, chemical reactions can go in the reverse direction too, so that we can get our reactants back. These are called reversible reactions, and we show this by drawing two opposing arrows between the reactants and the products, which shows that the reaction can go in both directions, as in this example. You can understand why if you think about our discussion of activation energy from the last video. If the reaction is going in the usual direction, from left to right, this is the activation energy. But if the reaction runs in reverse, the reaction will have a different activation energy to overcome, which will be this. So the reaction is still possible in the reverse direction, and that's the case for lots of different reactions. The discovery that many reactions could occur in both directions didn't come until the 19th century, and it was made in part because of the French general Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1798, Napoleon crossed the Mediterranean and began the conquest of Egypt. But Napoleon wasn't only interested in conquering new territory. He also wanted to enhance France's reputation as a center of learning and intellectual prestige. So he brought about 150 French scientists, writers, artists, archaeologists, and geographers with him. The idea was that these people would explore the interior of Egypt, which Europeans didn't know very much about at the time. One of these was the chemist Claude-Louis Berthollet. He was especially interested in salt lakes that are deep in the deserts of Egypt, and in 1803 he paid several of them a visit along with Napoleon's entourage. Here's a photo of one. It's possible that this was one of the lakes that Berthollet himself visited. Berthollet found that there were deposits of sodium carbonate being produced along the shore. That's the white powder that you can see in the shallow water here he realized that the sodium carbonate was being formed according to this reaction. Sodium chloride is naturally in the salt water, and the calcium carbonate comes from the limestone which is at the bottom of the lake. This was actually a surprising discovery. The reaction that chemists knew about at the time was this one. Sodium carbonate and calcium chloride combine to form calcium carbonate and sodium chloride. That's the opposite of the reaction that Berthollet saw happening in the lake. That means that the reaction should really be written this way, with two reaction arrows to show that it can go in either direction. This was the first time that a reversible reaction was observed, and chemists soon found out that many reactions can happen in both directions. Now think about what happens in this kind of a reaction. Suppose we have a reversible reaction like this. A and B react to form C, and this reaction can also run backward, so that C reacts to give us back A and B. Suppose we just start with the beaker full of A and B, with no C in it. From our earlier discussion in video 9, we know that reactions start at a very fast rate, because the reactants collide with each other very often. However, the reaction gets slower and slower as the amount of product increases and the reactants go down. 
For that reason, the forward reaction, this one, starts fast and gets slower. But the exact opposite will happen in the reverse reaction. We start with no C molecules, so the reverse reaction, which has C as a reactant, starts out with a rate of zero. However, the amount of C will start to increase because of the forward reaction, and that'll allow the reverse reaction to start. As the amount of C increases, the rate of the reverse reaction will go up. So the forward reaction gets slower, and the reverse reaction gets faster. If we were to plot the rates on a graph, they'd look like this. As we saw a moment ago, the forward reaction gets slower and slower, and the reverse reaction starts at zero and gets faster. Eventually, the two rates will become equal. That means that as many molecules of C get formed in the forward reaction as get consumed by the reverse reaction. The same is true for A and B. Just as much gets produced by the reverse reaction as gets used in the forward reaction. When a reversible reaction reaches this point, we say that it's at equilibrium. So a reaction's at equilibrium when the forward and reverse reactions have the same rate. Notice that this doesn't mean that the concentrations of the reactants and products are the same. In fact, that's usually not the case. The concentrations of all the reactants and products may be very different at equilibrium. However, although the concentrations aren't equal, there is a connection between the concentrations of the reactants and the products. Suppose we have a generic reaction like this, where there are two reactants and two products, and the coefficients in the balanced reaction are lowercase a, b, c, and d. It turns out that the product and reactant concentrations are in a ratio like this at equilibrium. In the numerator is the concentration of each product in molarity, raised to an exponent that's the same as the coefficient from the balanced reaction. If there were more than two products, there would be more terms in the fraction. In the denominator is the same thing, but this time it's the reactant concentrations instead of the products. It turns out that this ratio will always have the same value when the reaction is at equilibrium. So for example, think about this reaction. The product concentration goes in the numerator, and the two reactants go in the denominator. Notice that the balanced reaction shows that bromine has a coefficient of 2, so the concentration of bromine in the denominator has an exponent of 2. We call this kind of ratio the equilibrium constant, and it has a symbol k. Notice that this is a capital K, not a lowercase k, like the rate law constant we used in the last few videos. Every reversible reaction has its own value for the equilibrium constant. As we'll see in the next few videos, the equilibrium constant is a very useful property of a reaction. It turns out that there are only a couple of rules to know about the equilibrium constant. First, remember that in order to have a molarity, we need to have a solute and a solvent. So if we have an aqueous solution, we write its concentration in the equation for K. But we can't have a molarity for a pure solid or a pure liquid. So solids and liquids don't get used in the equilibrium expression. For example, Here's a chemical reaction in which acetic acid and water react to form acetate ions and hydronium ions. It's a reversible reaction, so we can write an equilibrium expression for it. We write the products in the numerator and the reactants in the denominator. The coefficients in the balanced reaction are all 1, so all of the exponents are also 1. But we're not quite done. Notice the phases of each of these compounds. Three of them are aqueous solutions, so we can measure those molarities. However, water is a pure liquid in this reaction. That means we don't use it in our equilibrium expression, and we should leave it out. Here's another example. This time, we have three aqueous solutions and a solid. That means we'll leave the chromium-3 hydroxide out of the equilibrium expression. We put the other concentrations in the equation. Also, notice that two of the coefficients are three, so we need to raise those two concentrations to the third power. 
Now here's one last example. In this reaction, the silver chloride is a solid, so we'll leave it out of the equilibrium expression. We put the products in the numerator and the reactants in the denominator. But in this case, we're leaving out the reactant because it's a solid, so we don't have a denominator in this one. For now, there's only one more rule that you need to know about equilibrium expressions. If the compounds in the reaction are all gases, we can still calculate the value of K in the usual way. We measure the concentrations and plug them into the equation. However, sometimes it's easier to measure the pressure of a gas instead of its concentration. In that case, we can use pressures instead of concentrations in our expression for the equilibrium constant. In that case, we'd write the equilibrium expression this way. We measure the pressures in atmospheres. Notice that we still need to raise each pressure by the coefficient in the balanced reaction. Now let's try a few examples with numbers. Suppose we have this reaction. At equilibrium, we measure the concentrations and find out that we have 0.150 molar carbonic acid, 1.82 times 10 to the minus 6 molar H+, and 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 7 molar carbonate. What's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? First, we need to write the equilibrium expression. All the compounds are aqueous, so they all go in the fraction. The exponents on carbonic acid and carbonate are both 1, but the one on H plus is 2. Now we'll plug in the concentrations we were given. When we do the calculation, we find out that K is equal to 2.01 times 10 to the minus 17. There are a couple of useful things to notice about this answer. First, notice that I didn't write any units for the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant never has units. It looks like it should have units, since the molarity doesn't seem to cancel out. But when you take a course in physical chemistry, you'll find out why K doesn't have units. I hope you will take that course one day. Another thing to notice is that the value of K is very tiny. That tells us that there aren't very many products. If you look at the concentrations, you can see that that's true. There's much more reactant than product at equilibrium. When this happens, we say that the reaction favors the reactants. If the opposite were true, we'd say that the reaction favors the products. When that happens, the value of K will be a very high number instead of a very low one. Let's try another example. Suppose we have this reaction. And at equilibrium, the pressures of the gases are 0.800 atmospheres for sulfur trioxide, 0.0285 for sulfur dioxide, and 0.0142 for oxygen. What's the equilibrium constant? Because all the compounds are gases, we can use the pressures in our equilibrium expression, which looks like this. Remember that we need to use 2 for the exponent on the SO2 and SO3. We plug in the data from the question, and that gives us an equilibrium constant of 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5. Notice that this number is much less than 1, so this example is another reaction that favors the reactants. As I mentioned earlier, the equilibrium constant of a reaction is a very useful piece of information. Once we know the equilibrium constant, it will always be the same number for that reaction, and that'll help us make helpful predictions about the final concentrations in the reaction. For example, suppose we perform that last reaction again, but this time we start with different amounts of gases. When it reaches equilibrium, we find out we have 1.00 atmospheres for sulfur trioxide and 0.0350 for oxygen. What's the pressure of the sulfur dioxide? We already know the equilibrium expression for this reaction, which is this. We'll plug in the pressures for SO3 and oxygen. We also know the value of K, which we calculated in the last problem. It's 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5. So now we can solve for the pressure. Don't forget that the pressure here has an exponent on it, so we'll need to take the square root in order to get the pressure by itself. We get 0.0150.
5.14 times 10 to the minus 4 for p squared. Now we take the square root and find that we get 0.0227 atmospheres. Notice that this is only the pressure of the sulfur dioxide. The total pressure in the container would be the sum of all the different partial pressures. So in this case, that's 0.0227 atmospheres for the SO2, plus 1.00 for the SO3, and 0.0350 for the oxygen, which gives us a total pressure of 1.06 atmospheres. There's one last thing to know about equilibrium constants. As we've seen, when you have gases in a reaction, you can calculate the equilibrium constant using either the pressures or the concentrations. However, these won't both give you the same number as a result for K. K will be different depending on whether we use concentrations or pressures. For that reason, when we write the value of K for a reaction that has gases in it, we should use the symbol Kc or Kp instead of just K so that we know whether it was calculated using concentrations or pressures. But sometimes we want a specific one of these. We want to know K based on concentrations or pressures. Fortunately, we can convert from one to the other using this equation. In this equation, R is the gas law constant, which you might remember is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres divided by kelvins times moles and the temperature should be in kelvins. The exponent up here needs a little explanation. It's the coefficients of all the products minus the coefficients of all the reactants in the balanced reaction. In this case, there are two of each, but you could have more or fewer coefficients depending on the balanced reaction. For example, in the previous problem, we calculated the equilibrium constant using pressures. What would be the value of Kc at 25.0 degrees Celsius? Here's that reaction again. We're looking for Kc, so we'll plug in all the other data. We had 1.80 times 10 to the minus 5 for Kp, and our temperature is 298.15 Kelvin. The exponent will be all the product coefficients minus all the reactant coefficients. So that's 2 plus 1 minus 2, for a total exponent of 1. That gives us 24.466 in the parentheses on the right side. When we solve for Kc, we get 7.36 times 10 to the minus 7. Notice that that's significantly different from the Kp we got. Well, that's enough new material for today. You'll get plenty of practice on this material in class, on quizzes, and on the homework. We've talked a lot about reversible reactions today, but there's still a lot more we can do with them. Reversible reactions are especially important for understanding physiology and the kinds of reactions that happen in living things. We'll be talking a lot more about them in the next several videos, so I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!